Thank you very much. It is truly uh, my pleasure to be participating in this wonderful event today. And I am going to talk to you a little bit about finance and what we're calling the rise of the machines. This work relates to uh, some collaborations we have with Neil Johnson at the University of Miami. And in many ways, my talk this afternoon continues the discussion that Neil began here at last year's TEDx event at UVM. And so for those that might recall, Neil spoke about our research in conflict. And today, I'm going to discuss our research in finance. And you might ask the question, well, how do they relate? What is the relationship maybe between conflict and finance? Great question. And certain, in certain ways, you might think terrorist financing and others, which is certainly one relationship. But here, our research stems from our interest in investigating the dynamics of adaptive actors that interact in a strategic, con in a strategic context. And for the case of conflict and finance, these are large-scale socio-technical systems where the outcomes of those systems are of critical importance to, to entire societies. So on with the story as it relates specifically to finance. So we are extending the work of Benoit Mandelbrot, who we hold in the highest regard here. And many decades ago, as many as 50 years ago, we learned from Mandelbrot that real markets don't behave the way theory, financial theory tells us that they should. In particular, we know that price changes in financial time series are not Gaussian distributed. In fact, they're fractal across all time scales. So stated another way, what that means is we see much bigger changes in the financial time series than theory tells us to expect. Specifically, those price changes are power law distributed. So our question here is, does that still hold true? Is Mandelbrot's finding uh, still correct? And it's not that we're saying he's wrong. Instead, what we're saying is maybe the game has changed uh, in the last half dozen years or so because of policy changes and technological advances. Okay. So first, I'm going to ask in the audience, do we have any market microstructure experts in the audience? Okay, yes, we do. Good. So I'll keep an eye on him, and if he starts to shake his head in, in, in disagreement, I'll let everybody know. Otherwise, we're going to press on here and talk a little bit about the mechanics of modern electronic exchanges. Okay? And in particular, what that means is that a trader essentially has the option of placing two different kinds of trades when he or she comes to the market. You can place a limit order, which specifies the number of shares to exchange, and the worst price that the trader is willing to accept, or a market order where you, again, specify the size of the trade but not the price. The trader is willing to accept the best price that the market has available at the time that the order arrives at the market. And so with that very brief explanation, we'll step through a little animation here of how the markets actually behave in terms of the arrival of orders, the percolating black squares are actually cancellations. Order, a trader decides that he or she is no longer interested in processing that limit order, where the limit order is, is canceled. And one thing I, I, I want you to think about or imagine when you watch this animation play forward is high frequency trading is operating at such an unbelievable pace. We can't even render the, um, the arrival rate of those orders in this computer. It, it simply can't reflect as many as 10 orders every second arriving to the exchange, and 90% of those orders are subsequently canceled before they're executed. And yet, high-frequency trading can still count for as much as 70% of the volume that we see in an entire market. Think about how many orders that must be when we cancel 90% of them, and yet they still generate 70% of the overall volume. So stepping back from the mechanics of the exchange itself, what impact, if any, might that have on the dynamics of the time series? What we've identified is these market events we're calling market microfractures. They co happen in both directions. It can be a crash or a spike. And what we've established is that you're looking for very, very small time frames, less than a second and a half or 1,500 milliseconds. 
and you're looking for a market event that moves the price approximately 1% or more, okay, in a very, very small period of time. And we're controlling for things like limited liquidity and volatility and volume and, and other things. So you might, the statisticians in the audience might say, well, that could just happen by chance, and it, maybe it could. Um, but in the instance of JP Morgan here in May of 2009, in a little more than a tenth of a second, or 150 milliseconds, JP Morgan moved 1%, crashed 1%. Maybe that's not that impressive. Maybe there's a collective yawn in the audience. But how that translates, that's more than a billion dollars with a B in market capitalization for JP Morgan in a little more than a tenth of a second. We think that's significant. And Again, for the statisticians that might think, well, that could just happen by chance. Yes, it could. Um, but did I mention I have 18,519 more of these? And I'll now step through them to convince you that these are important. Um, we don't have time for that. What we'll do is we'll instead we'll talk about where in the market these fractures are occurring and when they're occurring in the larger marketplace. So if I told you that we've binned the 20 stocks where the most fractures have occurred, okay? And that's what these green lines are, okay? The solid green lines are, are major financial institutions. And if I told you that the 13 most fractured stocks are all major financial institutions, would you find that interesting? If I told you that those green bars, the solid green bars are the financials, the dash are the non-financials. They extend over the date range of where those fracture events are escalating. They're, they're occurring at, a, at an increasingly rapid rate. And they all seem to converge right into September of 2008, which maybe coincidentally coincides with uh, the Lehman Brothers, declaration of bankruptcy, okay? And the only major financial institution that extends beyond that, significantly beyond that, is AIG. And some of you might remember that AIG had a special role to play in the financial crisis of, uh, of 2008. Okay. Some of you are still skeptical. I can sense it. So for the, for the statisticians in the audience, here is the, the statistical test where we're saying, okay, let's look at the distribution of sizes of these fractures themselves. And they are not power law distributed below the sub-second scale. Okay, this is where the, the Mandelbrot finding starts to break down. And in particular, for crashes, what you'll see in that gray area off to the left at the 650 milliseconds, okay, that below 650 milliseconds for these fracture events that that occur for less than 650 milliseconds, we know they're not power law distributed in size. 650 milliseconds is interesting because it also serves as a behavioral lower bound for human response time. Experiments have shown that chess grandmasters require at least 650 milliseconds to identify uh, whether or not their king is in checkmate, okay? And for spikes, we also see that the power law distribution in fracture size breaks down below the second scale. And so for us, we're very confident, and we can say definitively, that that represents a phase change into the machine-only regime of where the only things acting in the marketplace at the sub-second scale are machines trading with machines. Okay. Why? Well. We like to think about generating mechanisms. And what we hypothesize is that the generating mechanism has changed, and has changed in the last decade, maybe even less. And one way to think about that generating mechanism is, is to essentially unpack what it means for a high-frequency trading algorithm to be fast. And fast is comprised of at least three major components. So the connection speed between the algorithm and the market itself, the processing speed of the hardware on which the algorithm resides. And the special sauce here is the, the computational complexity of the algorithm itself. 
And so for those first two, the connection speed, what, what we've depicted here and what we learned from Einstein decades ago is that information can't travel faster than the speed of light. That serves as a lower bound. And our connection speeds are pressing up against that as fast as they possibly can. But those, com those, com those connection speeds are commercially available. And high frequency trading organizations are consuming that, that bandwidth. Or in some cases, they're jumping ahead and doing what's called co-location, where they essentially, where their algorithms reside directly at the exchange themselves. Specialized hardware. We now have hardware that can process a, an order in less than a microsecond. And so, the, again, and that is also commercially available. So the special sauce, the differentiator, is this computational complexity of the algorithm itself. And yet, in order to take full advantage of the specialized hardware and your unique access to the market, you want to be able to preserve a low computational complexity such that your algorithm runs as fast as possible. Because it's really about being fast, maybe even more so than being good. And so this is how we explain how the generating mechanism might have changed. And what, what I hope we've, we've convinced you of today is that we have identified more than 18,000 of these market microfractures and that those fractures themselves are concentrated in major financial institutions leading up to the financial crisis itself. And while, while this species of trading inhabits the ecosystem of trading behavior at the sub-second scale, high frequency trading can contribute to big scale, big fail, and we hope that we've convinced you to today that that is an idea worth sharing. Thank you very much.